come once again to discuss things. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Geeky Gentlemen. I am Sid Part 2, joining me today is Steve Baxi and Ruben Board, aka Steve Baxi and the Comics Kid 299. Hello gentlemen. So, You know, I was thinking about this the other day, I always introduce myself as Sid Part 2 and then I'll usually introduce co-hosts by their first name and then their username, and I don't know if I ever say, my name is Ian Harrington. It's... Mm. I, I, I just... The illusion is shattered. I thought your name was just Sid Part 2. I know, <laughs> I know. There's this fucking stalkery fan I had on YouTube for a while who became kind of an asshole, but for the longest time he'd be like, Mr. Part 2. And I'm like, that's... Why? Why, why are you calling me that? I I'm going to public... start calling you I, I, Please don't. <laughs> please whip. Please do. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so Steve picked our review topic tonight, and uh, it's it's sad. So Steve, what are we talking about? So, because we were all super, super hyped for Black Panther, and we all love Black Panther, I th- figured we'd talk about uh, Ryan Cooligar's first feature film, Fruitvale Station, with Michael B. Jordan, produced by Forrest Whitaker. Yeah, it's interesting. There's a whole story behind that, but we'll, we can talk about that later. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, Michael B. Jordan, Ryan Cooligar, I guess, are just going to be one of those, those team things, kind of like Nolan was with Christian Bale for a while. Um, yep. Um... Cooligers only made three movies, and all three of them are Michael B. Jordan and uh, star Michael B. Jordan to some capacity. That's really cool. I can do yep. that. Um, okay, so this movie is really interesting because I'm gonna just come out and say, if this movie were cut very, very slightly differently, I'd probably hate it. But because of a very purposeful choice in the very beginning of the movie. It's a damn good film, but it's really, really hard to watch. Mm-hmm. It's exceptionally difficult to watch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, Steve, you picked, uh, what was it, Selma a couple weeks ago, and that was a hard film to watch. I talked about, you know, I, I had a bit of anxiety in certain scenes, and I almost couldn't make it through it. Um, this doesn't have the same anxious thing to most of it, except for one scene. But it definitely has a lot of the tragedy. Um, I, I think by the ending, there's a lot of anxiety, at least for me. Uh, this this movie is really fucking heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, where, where do we want to start with this, then? So, I okay, I, I think part of the reason um, I decided to pick this was I wanted to talk more about Ryan Cooligar as a director, and I thought this would be a fun pick because of how, like, intently edited it is and how kind of young but still really really powerful a performance michael b jordan gives but after rewatching it it became exceptionally clear that talking about the the director isn't really the point in talking about this movie the point about talking about this movie is so we can have a deeper conversation about how this country is really fucking racist and mm-hmm. the police are really fucking racist and the world's <laughs> terrible and everything is sad and wrong and bad. Um, yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. This this went from being a artistic analysis to just no, this is, the world's terrible and we got to do something because this was not fucking right. Mm-hmm. I don't know, uh, Ruben. What uh, S- Steve and I gave our general thoughts. What do you think of the movie generally? Uh- I more or less agree with you guys. Uh, I think it's a very well-made movie, uh, but I did not enjoy watching it. Uh, Usually my kind of movie is the kind of movie where I just want to, like, sit back and have a good time. And this movie is so deep and so heavy. Uh, It's got a lot of... I mean, it's based on a true story. uh, And so it's got a lot of it's just really emotionally heavy Mm -hmm. and uh i don't want to say traumatizing but you both said you know very hard to watch Uh, i agree with that i'll co-sign that uh it's not a movie i don't i don't think i will ever rewatch this movie uh i i do think it's something uh people 
should probably watch this movie once just to kind of, you know, this is what's going on. It's not just a, it's not something somebody made up. This is real stuff that's happened and is happening, uh, but it's not something that I enjoyed and it's not something that I would want to do again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't imagine trying to sit through this a second time. At least, like, you know, this is probably a good movie to hand to people. I don't know if I could sit there and watch this with someone else. Um, And even because the context that we're watching this in now is certainly very, very heightened and, and, and carries with it a lot of tragedy. But what's irritating is... The movie came out in in June or July, something like that. It was it was pretty late in 2013, like when it got its wide release, um, and it came out at the same time as the George Zimmerman trial. Mm-hmm. So you were watching that on the news while going to the theater to see this, and you would think that what five years after that you could watch this movie in a space that isn't resonating the same political climate. But no, it's actually become much worse, mm-hmm. and it's even harder to watch now than it was five years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I, I mentioned a very particular choice in the way this was edited that really, I think, makes or breaks the whole movie for me. Um, because if you were to take out the the actual footage of the real murder at the very, very beginning of the film... This would be a very boring fucking movie. Um, I mean, yeah. <laughs> like, everything that happens, it would just be, okay, it's just this dude with his family, and it's like a very character, think PC kind of thing, but, like, that's just not the kind of movie I like to watch. But by showing, here's a guy getting killed by police, and now we're going to start to focus on this, quote-unquote, random guy, as we say this is based on true events, you know instantly as an audience member with any kind of ability to recognize filmmaking you know that it's the guy that got shot and so every boring or or little character moment kind of scene is like this intense it's his last moment it's the last time he saw his daughter it's the last time he saw his family it's the last time he talked to this person and that just makes it so fucking sad it's very hard to contrive a situation where you can completely understand and have a character go through an arc and, and get a sense of who they are by snapshotting just one day. Mm-hmm. But this movie does it in one of the most natural and interesting ways that I've ever seen. I mean, there's a lot of movies that, technically speaking, take place over the course of maybe just a day, um, maybe even a couple hours, depending on what you're watching. But they don't have the kind of like complex i know what this person is or who this person is or how they feel or how they react or what their life is in that moment you just kind of know them for that particular circumstance but like from scene one you know who this guy is Mm -hmm. and it's it's just there are moments here and there where like you kind of want to say maybe they're laying it on too thick like when um like when the dog gets uh run over and he carries it back but it still works, and it still breaks your heart because it's it's still paralleling what's going to happen to him later. Mm-hmm. Um, one moment I kind of I kind of thought maybe they were laying it on a little thick was that both, uh, and I, I forgot the character's name, but Michael B. Jordan, his character's mom and Oscar. Uh, uh, yeah, Oscar, uh, both his mom and his uh, is it his wife or just his girlfriend? Girlfriend. 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 Uh, both of them were like both in a situation where it's like, I told him to go to the train station or I told him, let's go to this party. Like, it's my fault. Uh, I kind of, they, you see this in movies all the time, like where somebody survives, but then their parents die or like their best friend dies or whatever. And then they have survivor's guilt. Uh, but for some reason, and maybe, maybe there is some truth to how this played out. Maybe in real life, Oscar's mom did tell him, take the train. And maybe he didn't want to go to the party and his girlfriend did. So he went, uh, but I felt like that was like, oh man, that's like he's about to die, and they're both gonna like blame themselves. I I kind of thought that was laying it on a little thick. Although I agree, the dog scene too, uh, in a lot yeah. of ways. See, I don't know those those just felt re- very real because like even though I don't drink, I've had my mom tell me you know like don't go out driving on New Year's or don't go out driving on on uh, mm-hmm. Christmas Eve or whatever because a lot of people are out drunk and stuff, so you don't want to be driving the roads. And so I've just. That's that's the total mom thing. Um, yeah. 
And so just that felt very real. I, Steve, you probably know more about the production history behind this than I do. Do you know, like, because it says written and directed by Kugler, do you know how, much, how many interviews with the family and, and survivors that he did, or did he just yeah, go off so, the documentation? Um, yeah, so, so basically how this movie got started is um, Kugler was a, I think he was still in college, if not he was a graduate student or something like that in film school, um, when he decided he wanted to make this movie. Uh so he actually had a friend um, who the the lawyer that the family hired after this case was actually one of Kugler's friends, and so he got most of his information from him. But he but he, through that he actually started gaining the family's trust and interviewed them, and they became really close, um, which is why he was able to use the final shot of his, of his actual daughter and everything. So like he he went really deep into the court stuff. He went really deep into the fa- into the footage. Um, he knows the family really well. He had a lot of access to them, and they came forward um, very openly given the direction Kugler wanted to go with this movie. See, and that that kind of feels very apparent, even though I didn't know that. Like, just some of these interactions, some of the things that the characters say to him and uh, to Oscar, and, and some of the ways that he reacts and, and that Oscar is portrayed— it feels very, very genuine. Um, the thing there, there were two scenes in particular in this movie that have that genuineness, um, genuinity, genuineness, whatever the word is. Um, verbs. Yeah, words, things um, uh, that were were both either they weren't directly tied to to like the bigger themes movie, but were just very human reactions and very human situations that still broke my heart. the The big obvious one is after the mom found, finds out he's dead and she's trying to force the nurse to let him hug it, let her hug his body mhm uh that's just unbearable to watch but then the other big one is when he tells his girlfriend that he's actually been fired for a couple weeks now mm-hmm. and he's really tired and he wants to do something legal yep yeah, that... both of those scenes. Like, I I physically had a hard time watching them. I'm not even sure if I keep kept my eyes on the screen both times. Yeah, that one the the mother scene's just really hard to watch just because of how sad it is and and very very human. Um, and like the the idea of parent dealing with dead child goes back a long time. There's a great scene with uh, Priam and um, and Hector in the in the Iliad, um, but like. That one's very human, but the one that stuck out more to me as as far as the genuineness is the uh, where he admits that he got fired two weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Um, because what really works for me there is his girlfriend starts to insult him. Um, that's the part that feels incredibly genuine and like it would have to have come from an actual conversation he had with one of the survivors. If not the girlfriend herself than one of the family members. And I'm not saying that the day he died, this exact situation occurred, but it feels like maybe he took real moments from Oscar's life and put them into one day. Because when he tells her that he got fired and she's, and he's like, I'm trying, I I was open about this. And she goes, no, you were backed into a corner. You're pathetic. Like she, she really starts laying into him and you know, it's, it's genuine because they do not have a perfect relationship at all. This is not a, a, you know, romance for the ages kind of thing. They are with each other. They have a child and they're trying to make it work. And that's and this a is real what thing. I love about this movie is that regardless of how much it gets right or wrong about the actual facts of who the person was, it completely it completely makes the case that this was a human being that was in the middle of his life that was murdered. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's entirely about it's it's entirely about what that what living in that in this kind of world is, regardless of who you are. And it just it's so sad. Um, you were talking about how like maybe this didn't happen on that exact same day. Uh, there was one instance I did read up on this. Uh, 
the scene where he's helping the girl in the supermarket with the fish recipe and he calls up his grandma and gives her the phone. Uh, that was an instance where I, I read about that, where Coogler apparently had interviewed uh, the Oscar's grandma in real life. And she had told him about one time he called me and said, hey, there's this woman. Uh, she needs help with this recipe. And she had uh, he had asked for her special recipe. So it's a situation where maybe it didn't happen on that exact same day. But it's like he's taking these elements of real life and he's just cobbling together a somewhat composite story, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Like, uh, it didn't necessarily happen in this exact same way, but he's taking real elem real things that actually did happen and just putting them in a specific order. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I agree. I think the relationship, uh, it feels very real, uh, but at the same time, it's not... Uh, it's not a idealized relationship, but by the end of it, I really did think that I, I was rooting for them by the end. Uh, at the beginning yeah, of the like movie, I wasn't sure. You think they can about... make it work, you know? Yeah. You, you think they can make it work. Um, to go more into the genuineness, Oscar feels like a very, re very real person, and they kind of show him warts and all, which is, is I feel, too pronged because, it, again, it makes him feel like a real person, but it plays into a narrative politically that I really, really appreciate that they did. Um, so Oscar is like the way he's portrayed in this movie, if I were to be, you know, objective and yeah, it's, it's of course sad that he died, but Oscar's a bit of a hothead. He's easily angered and he's done some dickhead and just plain wrong things in his life. That is, I think, a fair assessment based on the portrayal of the character in this movie. But he's still a person, and he's trying his best to get better. Um, yeah. You know, the first scene with Michael B. Jordan and... Uh, what's what's the name of the um, actress playing the girlfriend? Um, um, something Diaz. Yeah, well, the, the first scene with those two, she says, Every time you touch me, all I think about you... All I think about is you touching that bitch. So he cheated on his girlfriend. He cheated mm -hmm. on the mother of his child. We know that for a fact multiple times by her assessment and he doesn't even bother to deny it um you know that's that's a dick thing he's done things that are bad uh we we show that he has a criminal record and that even after getting out of prison he's at least been tempted and probably done a little bit more uh drug selling criminal activity um that is a bad thing to do when you have a child. I don't care what your feelings on drugs are. Yeah, leaving a child for you to go to prison, that's a dick move for toward the child. But what I really, really appreciate about all that is it, of course, again, makes him more human. It, makes, it shows you that he's a person that made mistakes. Um, it shows you that he's trying to get better. So there's the human side of it. But on the political spectrum, when, when you hear the the opposition talk about uh you know problems with police brutality and police violence they're like well these are criminals like anytime one of these people one of these black guys gets shot by a police officer the conservative media goes straight to well he had a criminal record i remember i worked at a news station um when michael brown was shot uh and you know the second that the footage of him and his friends at the convenience store that they maybe, like, stole from came out. I was working at a Fox station, by the way. Uh, Fox local affiliate. Um, that was the top story from the Fox News department, and CNN and everything was mentioning that thing. So, like, there's this immediate attempt to discredit and and lower the the personhood of people based on criminal activity— and so what I like that this film does is it shows you he has he had a criminal past, but it also shows you that he's a person who's trying to do better and who still did not deserve to die. Because that's mm -hmm. the ultimate thing is like any time the like you see the conservative pundits say stuff like, well, he was a criminal and that's why I don't feel bad that he got shot. And like. He sold some fucking weed. Eric Gardner was selling cigarettes on the street. You don't deserve to die for that shit. Mm -hmm. 
it, you might, I might agree with you that it's a problem to sell drugs, especially if you're a, a parent, but no one deserves to die for that. Uh, and so that's like, that's the ultimate um, kind of, kind of send up of that is it gives you that it doesn't try to hide or it doesn't try to make excuses for Oscar's criminal past. It embraces it and shows, yeah, that was a formative part of what made him him. And he was trying to change his life by all accounts. It kind of reminds me of uh, when we talked about Selma and I had mentioned that I wished that that movie could have gone more into the faults of the person of uh, Martin Luther King and instead of portraying him more as like a uh, an icon. Uh, and this is the kind of movie that doesn't shy away from showing his faults. Uh, it very easily could have been a movie where we portray him as just like a perfect, innocent human being with no flaws at all. And then he was, you know in the wrong place at the wrong time, and then because of the color of his skin, he gets uh, persecuted. They they could have done that. And I think that would have been a very poor way to make this movie. I I think that the way, like you said, uh, they show that he wasn't perfect. Uh, He did some stuff. Uh, Did they actually mention that he was in jail for uh, for selling drugs? I I don't know. I assumed that's what it was because that's why he he throws – like he's thinking about that when he throws the bag away. So the implication I got was that it was because of drugs. I kind of got that too because like we know he had the bag later and then we saw him in jail in a flashback. But I wasn't sure if they actually mentioned why he was there the first time. But like we see he's in jail like you said. Uh, She mentions that he was cheating. Uh, He tells his boss or his former boss that he had some – he was trying to get his life together or something, and that's why he was late. And I'm not sure if the t- what the timeline is like, because that was just a couple weeks before the events of the main meet of the movie. And I don't know if he was just, if that was, like, right after he got out of jail. Like, I- I'm not sure. So, like, we know there's stuff going on with him that some of it is stuff that, like, he, he was uh, involved in stuff that he could have prevented. But what I really like, like you said, is that, he does make these choices and then he pays he he uh takes the consequences and then in some cases he makes the right choice and then like he ends up uh doing something right by his family um mm-hmm. like when he uh he pours the weed out he could have made some easy money right there but then he doesn't do it and he's doing that for his family uh i really like that we get to see him uh make tough choices that ultimately are what show him as a complete person, uh, as a fully formed, sometimes not good, sometimes good person. I I don't know. I like it. And part of part to your point earlier, Ruben, about how they could have just ma- idealized this or idealized him in order to like accentuate the the racism and how he was killed. I think part of why this works, and and part of why um, the idea that it is racism that killed him is even stronger in this account than if he was an idealized person is that you see really specifically and really painfully that he he is not a great person and he's had all of these troubles partly because of all of these imperfect social systems that perpetuate racism like there, there is a very human but there's also a really complicated intermixing of like he has to sell drugs he works in a grocery store um the kinds of music he listens to, the way police treat him, the way he interacts with other people, the way people react to him walking up in certain scenes um, and then have to get accustomed to him. Like, there's there's a really good and really subtle account of black experience that builds him up to being not the best person, but still completely human and, and worth of respect and trying to make the best out of the situation before he's killed by an even more extreme account of racism. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's really interesting. I also think, um, to your point about the, the subtleties of racism, I think it's very interesting in kind of that life is stranger than art way that he isn't killed by the explicitly racist cop. He's killed by the cop who gets caught up and, and enables the racist cop. Mm-hmm. I think that is really interesting. Like, you have the cop that, like, calls him a nigger and, and all this stuff, and he's definitely perpetuating in part of the problem by, like, stepping on Oscar's neck and all that stuff. But 
it's the the cop who doesn't say anything, who doesn't stop his his colleague from doing this, who doesn't tell his colleague to back the fuck off or or stop escalating the situation. Um, it's it's that cop that's just passively accepting racism in his department that ends up committing the act of murder. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That and is I, incredibly fascinating. I uh, Maybe I'm going too far here, but I also like that while I cannot remember the actor's name, the guy who played the blob in uh, X- X-Men Origins Wolverine, he's the, the really explicitly racist cop. Um, but he, even though he is the one who's like making this situation so much worse, after the other guy shoots Oscar, you can see a little bit of like, oh no, why has this happened? Like he's he's devastated in his own in a small way. Like he kind of pushes that cop at one point and says, Why did you do that? And then like he's the one that calls it in. And so like even though he is the closest thing to like pure evil that we have in this movie, he's still a little bit shocked and like we see a little bit of humanity there. Well um, one like, one thing that's really interesting about that character is he's the one trying to keep Oscar alive at the end. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, he's the one, it, like, he's the one probably the most responsible, even more so than the cop that shot shot Oscar. He's probably most responsible for Oscar's death, and he's the one trying to keep him alive. Mm-hmm. That is, yeah. I again, this is one of those things. I don't know how true to life that is. I really don't. Um, that could have been a directorial artistic choice. That could have been used for artistic license, or that could have been a real life thing. I don't know. Yeah, I and, and it's a really fascinating perspective on how he tries to make this fit between both real life and fiction because um you mentioned earlier that if it didn't open with the the amateur archive footage of the shooting um you wouldn't have liked this movie as much um but he was expressly against that decision for a very long time uh because he didn't like the idea of using real footage in the movie um but then slowly realized that because he grew up in that area he knows that footage and didn't want to rep- and recreate it. But if this is going to be a movie that changes people's minds and makes them understand what's happening, the rest of the world had to see that footage too. Mm-hmm. No, I, I, I completely agree. And again, it's just, even if you'd opened it with, you know, a recreation of that cell phone footage as opposed to the real cell phone footage, it it would have been somewhat strong, but it wouldn't have been nearly as strong as, as real footage. And to It's very so aware much- of... I have so much trouble watching stuff like that. Same. Oh, God. Uh, it just, it puts me back to when Mike Brown was shot. And, like, I remember all the footage of the crime scene. And the thing that I think hurt the most is is when I was editing, I had to uh, cut B-roll for voiceover, where it's just footage but no audio for the anchor or whoever to talk over. And... The shot that's just burned into my memory is Mike Brown's red hat on the street, inches away from his body covered by a sheet. And it's like the hat is in center focus. And just something about that is always in my head. And I had so much trouble cutting that thing. Um, no, I feel you. Um, the first time I saw this movie was a little bit after um, Keith Lamont Scott died. And he was killed... Like literally a, a a street away from my apartment. Wow. Um, like I was in the middle of the city while the Charlotte uprising was going on, and people were protesting that death for two, three nights straight. I had friends that were tear gassed and arrested and stuff after that. Like it's insane, like how much of the of that vividness this movie brings back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's crazy. Um, I this movie also like. I hate to say it, but, like, it made me feel like I'm, like, I'm really lucky. Like, I live in a kind of, like, it's a, it's not a, it's not a big city like this. So, like, you know, hearing you talk about that, Steve, like, I I can only imagine this hit home with you much more than it did with me. Like, I mean, I, we were all in the same boat of, like, this movie was hard to watch and, like, it really hit us emotionally. But I imagine, like you said, you were in the middle of, the city during like riots not that long ago like was it two years ago yeah or... uh he, he was shot in september of 2016 um okay. i remember because it was 
It was a Monday night, um, and I came back to my apartment um, that night after a really long day in class, and I turned on the news, and I found out that there was protests going on, and, like, police cars and everywhere, and I looked outside my window, and I, I saw, like, the police huddling around the body and everything. Mm. Wow. Like, it was legit right next door. And mm-hmm. then, like, for the next couple days and trying to get from my apartment to class... Uh, and then coming back home really late at night, being caught in the middle of all of the, that stuff. Yeah, I can only imagine, like, this this kind of movie would be even harder for you to watch after all that. Yeah, it's not fun. It is <laughs> not fun. It's just, it's really hard to see death. Um, like, we're, we're so desensitized to it um, that the real thing is scary. And this... This gives you such a close glimpse, such a, a sad and profound look at the real thing. Um, let me ask you this, because I'm not sure. I've, I've kind of been tossing the idea back and forth in my head, and I'm just curious what you guys think. Um, do you think it would have broke this movie or, or made it harder to watch or it wouldn't have worked if they um, showed the family grieving more, like done maybe the funeral for Oscar and that stuff? Or do you think that wouldn't have a place in here if they did any more i legit couldn't have took it yeah i i i i honestly think if there was even one more scene of that grieving i would not be able to finish the movie mm-hmm. yeah i i kind of agree but i don't know i feel like that i feel like that's a whole movie in and of itself you know yeah uh, yeah that's just just really really hard to watch too you're right yeah no i mean just even the scene, the the scene where they're in the hospital and the mom is like trying to get everyone under control and she's being very cool and very rational, and very supportive. Even that's like really difficult to watch. And mm-hmm. she's sitting there saying, "We need to be strong for him. He's going to pull through. I know it. I know it. He's going to pull through." And she says that like that is literally the last thing she says before the doctor walks in the room and tells them all he's dead. Oh, um, and you know, fucking, you're... fucking Octavia Spencer. She's so convincing and so powerful in those scenes, it's so difficult to watch. I know, I know. And, like, the thing is, you're tricked by the Hollywood machine. I feel like this this movie, that scene in particular, really, really plays on the Hollywood machine of we can't have sad endings. We can't do it. No, death does not exist in movies. Death is is always something that's beaten back the last second in movies and television. Any other, like, fictional movie, he would he was going to pull through. He was going to be okay. Well, and see, that's the thing. With how competently the film is made, it does the thing that I think every great movie with a tragic or twist ending does, which is you've seen it multiple times. You know what the ending is. But you're so caught up in watching it again that you're still subconsciously or even consciously hoping for a different ending, mm-hmm. even though you physically know that's not possible. Yeah, no, you're sitting And there in that scene it. where she's like, he's going to pull through, and I keep going, yeah, he is, and obviously he's not. Yeah, I mean, this movie wouldn't exist if he was going to pull through, right? Yeah, um, yeah. But you, you wish so hard he could. Yeah, definitely. Um, something I want to get into more is the... Uh, the real world, world politics. And I, I mentioned this earlier, but we kind of got sidetracked with talking more about the character stuff. But um, I wanted to get Steve's feedback. What do you think of the idea of, of showing him warts and all for that, what I feel is very purposeful to kind of shut down the, the conservative media argument? So part of what I like about that is every time one of these shootings happens, um, the a lot of the spin articles always have particularly this phrasing of they were no angel like for some reason it's it's not enough that they that they say they weren't good people or great people they had to very specifically say that they weren't angels or something as if like if they were idealized people then that would be the only thing that makes this tragic Mm -hmm. um so the idea that you completely dis- you, you completely dismantle the fact that this movie is in any way going to try and portray him idealized um helps to shut that down a little bit but more than that that it there that there's that there's some kind of weird narrative in, in american culture of like if someone's doing a bad thing 
they're almost like mustache twirling, like, ha ha, I'm doing a bad thing. The fact that they do, they make this movie so so clear of, regardless of how many bad choices he makes, he's he has a conviction in them, he realizes they're wrong, and he's com- conflicted scene to scene, even when he's doing the right thing. And even if someone's going to be like some weird hardline stance of wrong is wrong, right is right, it's very, very difficult not to give Michael B. Jordan's character the benefit of the doubt or credit to like, no, they understand that perspective. They just can't afford to to pick it up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I I love like how it, it emotionally forces you into the situation to accept that, yeah, life sucks and people have to do bad things. That doesn't mean you murder them. Mm hmm. No, I, I completely agree, and that's the thing I, I really, really like, is I feel like the weird thing about that narrative that gets me the most is it somehow assumes that the police knew that. Yeah. Like, that, you know, every time one of these shootings happens, conservative media, mostly Fox, digs through this person's life and tries to find out when they stole a candy bar when they were 12 or whatever. Um, I listened to an interesting podcast called Serial, and it was about a uh, legal murder, or, uh, a legal homicide case against this uh, Muslim guy, and he was accused of killing his girlfriend in high school. And by the end of the series, they don't draw any like firm conclusions that he definitely did it or definitely didn't. The reporter says, "I don't think he did it," and here's all the stuff for him, and here are the things that I'm still like. Uh, maybe he's really, really good at faking. But anyway, like, they go through this this whole thing, and there's all these people saying, oh, no, I'm, I'm so sure he did it because of this one random moment, or, or, like, he stole money from the mosque when he was a kid, so he wasn't a, a saint or whatever. I'm like, okay, but you're acting like... You're acting like the police that commit these these acts of brutality somehow know that, you know, this this kid stole a candy bar twenty years or ten years ago or whatever, right? Um, they never they never addressed the fact of the police officer didn't have intimate knowledge of this person. Don't try to pretend that they did. And even if they did, they're still not supposed to, like it says right in like in, in legal code that you're not allowed to treat anyone differently depending on whether or not they may have you think they actually committed a crime the whole point of policing the idealized version of it is innocent until proven guilty that's that's the whole assumption that you're supposed to have and so i'll see stuff where there's this interesting news report where um a guy who i believe was like identified with black lives matter and everything agreed to go through some of the training they put police officers through wherein they they put them in like intense situations where they don't know what someone has and they like everybody has like paintball guns or whatever um and like yeah the situations that the officers are in are incredibly can be incredibly intense i'm not going to try to deny that but the whole point is you're supposed to be putting your life on the line not innocent people this isn't a conversation about are there people who have screwed up in the past this is a conversation about police officers are taking the the uh, th- taking force too far. They are using too much deadly force. They are using too much brutal force, and they don't. They shouldn't. Like and these like implicitly racist things are coming to light because of the deadly force and people are getting exhausted by it. It doesn't matter what the victim did or didn't do in their past. What matters is how they were acting in the moment, whether or not the police escalated it unnecessarily as is what clearly happened here um they that shit is completely irrelevant what matters is the use of force and why it's why that's not the focus of these why are you focusing on the victim's past why aren't you focusing on the situation itself yeah i agree completely Mm -hmm. um man sorry getting a little choked up on that um, but I just, that whole, that whole slant to it, it's like, it's the ultimate attempt to just avoid the conversation. It's the change the subject dynamic. And so again, showing Oscar warts and all is a really, really good way to completely subvert that because it shows you that he's a person who has done bad things and isn't, you know, again, is no angel, 
But it also shows you that he's a person and he has family that loves him and he did not deserve to die. And I think part of how it earns that is that there's no catharsis at the end of this. Mm. Like, he's shot, he dies, and it's over. Like, it, it, it leaves you completely emotionally hanging. That fucking scene in the shower is the... I couldn't. I just fucking couldn't. They Ugh. fucking end the movie on that. I have no idea how the fuck... Did Kugler edit this shit, too? I don't know for sure, but I'm sure he oversaw it. Yeah, I'm sure he was involved in the edit like any good director. And just, I can't imagine editing this. I just can't. Part of the editing process, unless it's something really simple, is you have to watch scenes over and over and over again and, like, objectively and meticulously detail every little bit. How the fuck can you do that with with the damn shower scene? It's so sad. Mm-hmm. <sighs> yeah, I, uh, and, like, even before that, when she goes and picks up her daughter at the sleepover and, like, you can see her sister in the kitchen crying, and it's like, there's no words. It's just, you know, a silent scene. And, like, you, you're just imagining, like, when she comes in, like, you're, like, for me, I'm just kind of filling in the blanks of the, like, what we didn't see in my mind. I'm thinking, like, oh, she's already told her sister. And, like, you know, her sister's having this little miniature meltdown and, like, she's trying to figure out how is she going to tell her children that their uncle is dead. And, like, just all that stuff. It's, like, really difficult to swallow there. And, like, it's it's given to you, like... Like you guys mentioned earlier, if that if any of that had been longer, this movie would have been even more difficult to watch. But like it's it's all just right there in like a five minute span. Like it it hits you really fast and really hard in such a short amount of time. Yeah, and I and like you said about we seeing it over and over again. Um, there's stories about how when they got because they shot this movie over the course of I want to say like twenty days or something like that. Um, it's, it's a pretty short amount of time, but given the runtime, it's, it makes some sense. Um, and they'd have to shoot like four hours or so on the, on the actual platform where he was shot, uh, for a few days at a time. And every time they went there, they had to have like some kind of moment of silence. They had to stop and pray. They were completely unnerved. And like, just imagine, cause he, Kugler lived in this area and, and saw and knew about when Grant was shot. Um, and him as a person getting, going to hit the tra- trajectory of his life that he did because of, because of this news story and then coming back and having to film that scene in that space over and over again, like that could not have been easy. No. Just existing in that space. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. One hour and 25 minutes. Dude, this movie feels longer. You got me curious. It feels you... like a journey. Yeah, it this really feels... Does. This feels like a very long movie. This is a good. Uh, this is a good example of uh, why biopics don't need to be three and a half hours long. You can show who someone was in a in a day of their life. You know, mm-hmm. um, God. When people rank the best biopics of all time, I don't usually see this one on there. I think most people don't realize this is a biopic. I mean, it's still you know five years, but it's still relatively new. That's fair. Um, like I, I, I don't know, I. I don't watch a ton of like list videos and stuff like that, so maybe it's it's. Come it's up. just weird because I see people talk about this movie and praises all the time. I just never see. I never hear the phrase biopic in this movie in the same sentence usually. Well, it is mm-hmm. like it's so about his life, right? Especially yeah. knowing that, like, like what Ruben mentioned, that Kugler took moments from probably other days, other points of his life, and kind of put them into this one final day. Um, that's that's really interesting, and it just it gives you a really well crafted narrative of the person. I mean, I'll be fair; most biopics are like about historically important people, and so we so we try to show these things that are like monumental moments in their life the points. Yeah, as as like years apart and stuff. So I'll I'll be fair; you probably couldn't do. It. It'd be really weird to see like a Winston Churchill movie that puts you know him bashing Gandhi and him, you know, telling everybody that we need to go get at Hitler. Uh, it'd be weird if he'd give that in one speech. <laughs> yeah, I think the only time that's ever really worked, arguably, is Lincoln. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, uh, so 
like I, I would consider this a biopic, wouldn't you? Because it's it is his life, right? No, it, it literally is. I'm not saying mm. it's not. It's just kind of funny to to see that we don't. The discourse around this movie doesn't isn't centered on biopics for some reason. I just think that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, there's so much more to it. It's also, again, there's so much stuff here where like. If you told me they changed it for the sake of the narrative, I would completely believe you. Like, the fact that it happens on the last day of 2008, New Year's Day 2009, that's crazy to think about. The way that this movie is structured, the way this is like him deciding to to make big changes in his life and everything, it feels like that is a narrative choice to set it on New Year's Day. Mm Mm-hmm. And then you realize this actually happened on New Year's Day. Yeah, and it's... I, I, I don't know what to do with that. Yeah, it feels it feels like, like you said, like that's uh, something they... Well, we have to come up with a reason for them to be out so late. And, like, they, they're going to... Like, it's not just they're going to a party. It's that, like, everyone in town is, you know, going out and, and celebrating and... Like let's so let's put it on at the end of the year. No, like it, like you said, it actually happens. But you're right; it does feel kind of manufactured. No, I mean not only that, but just the the themes of renewal and new directions in life, and that's like the whole point of the quote unquote holiday of New Year's. I, I don't really consider New Year's a holiday, but maybe I'm weird. Um, like that that whole. Sorry, go, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna. Say, I was just gonna make a joke. Uh, like the. Um... This is basically the really sad version of New Year, New Me. <laughs> I don't even know what that is, but it sounds funny. Um, I'll give you a I'll give you a courtesy laugh. How's that? Um, <laughs> no, but like, you are still so, behind the memes. It's sad. I know. I know. I'm 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 old, Steve. I'm You're old. You're not that much older. <laughs> anyway, uh, no, but like with all the themes of renewal and and life changes in this, to set it all on New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, yeah, is just it feels like like i feel like if i wrote that in a story and handed it in to one of my creative writing professors in college they'd tell me it's i'm going too far and it's too it's too much of a bordering on a cliche to set it on new year's day (laughs) i mean truth is stranger than fiction like it's it's crazy how much of this just works from that natural story Mm -hmm. and then there's just like it's this movie's set 10 years ago at this point yeah that's, man, I mean nine, but whatever. Close uh, enough. Yeah, it's, like, it's it's weird for me, because I remember 2008, and what's even weirder, I don't remember hearing about this case. Um, it didn't get the attention that the other cases would later, partly because you would expect this kind of thing to be an anomaly, and it's, not only was it never an, not an anomaly, but that it's gotten worse over time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like as tragic as this is, is this really the worst case of it? And at least the officer went to jail, right? Only for like this months. is one of the happier stories. Yeah, this is best case scenario, right? That's yeah. that's fucked. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah. That, like I, I feel bad for laughing, but like just the the tragic irony of that is actually hilarious. If it wasn't so sad, yeah. I mean, like. 10 years from now, if you wanted to make a movie about um, innocent black men being shot by police officers, this would not be on the top of your list, primarily because there, it, it, it had a happy ending, quote-unquote. Right? Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Man. And, like, it's, it's crazy that, like, they just give you the... There's something... There's a, I think it's a German word about... Like, it, it, Germans are so good at coming up with the word, but there's a German word that's synonym is truth, but it's... Verisimilitude? Maybe. It's direct translation is black and white, as in truth is black and white. Um, and so that, like, it just ends with black screen, white text, and gives you the context of everything that happened with the uh, court case following this, that the officer spent 11 months in jail and was released on good behavior. Yep. And that, like, I don't know, that puts you in a weird place as a lefty that, uh, at least for me, and I imagine you probably had a similar reaction, Steve, puts you in a weird place as a lefty that, like, has serious problems with the American criminal justice system, um, Mm -hmm. the the prison industrial complex, of, like, sentences being far too extreme and, and not taking into account, um 
prison culture and and things that it encourages you to do and and all this stuff so like yeah i do believe that people even people convicted of things like manslaughter and i'll you know i'll be generous i'll give the officer i don't think it was murder i think manslaughter is a acceptable charge in this case um and from what's shown in the film i don't know the particulars of of the real life events so i don't want to sound too much like i'm i'm judging but uh you know someone convicted of manslaughter uh that is you know trying their best to not break more laws while in prison not get further into uh criminal culture um yeah i think that i could totally understand someone getting out of jail after 11 months for a crime like that i i like logically everything that i believe about the prison industrial complex i'm willing to accept that it's so hard like i'm just i'm angered by the 11 months thing that this guy got off with like i it's it's that really weird imbalance between you know quote unquote logical understanding and emotional reaction like i'll I'll meet people all the time who say shit like i don't understand the difference between logic and emotion they're the same thing you know you just no you have no idea so many times i can feel one way but no i'm completely wrong or, or vice versa um no, I'm completely right, but feel completely wrong about something, and I'm, I'm kind of having that right now while, while thinking about the the sentencing of the police officer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and and I think that's also kind of uh, maybe goes back to like how we were talking about how the movie, you know, by the end of it, we see all these things that Oscar did. Some of these things were wrong, but he did it for his family. Uh, but it's showing us the good and the bad. And then in the same way with the cop, like it's showing us this really horrible racist guy who at the end of the, a- after Oscar gets shot, he's still trying to, to save Oscar. And so like, it's kind of the same thing. Like you can see things one way, but then feel another way. Like, and it's, you know, you look at it from a certain point of view and then you try to look at it from another point of view. I think it's kind of, it's definitely trying to evoke that reaction. I think. Is Oscar's last line, I have a daughter? I think so. Yeah. God, that's really hard. Um, that's his last line, and then she's the last shot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's just one of those things, like, the the cop, you know, we, we've talked about him as, quote-unquote, the racist cop, because he drops the N-bomb. Um, you know, I'm not even sure if that guy's actually racist or if he's doing the cop, like, you know, actually racist, he's a fucking cop, but, or if he's doing the cop thing of putting on a tough face, because there's this whole, there's this whole police culture thing of trying to, to be a badass. Uh, Bobby, my best man at, at my wedding and everything, he, um, he at one point applied to be a prison guard and he told me about the interview process and they're like, they asked me if I'd ever been in a fight and if I'd lost or won and, and stuff like that. I'm like, man, they really perpetuate a lot of this this tough guy bullshit because they don't want people to to care about these people. So you have this police officer who's, at the very least, putting on a tough guy face, if not openly and, and outwardly racist. And he's just... You feel like he's shocked by the results of him escalating a situation, of his escalation yeah. of the situation. I mean, it's what happens when you buy into that myth of toxic masculinity, that even even Oscar had that to a degree, but his Obviously. awareness and attempt to get better is what made him a good person. And the cop completely buying into it and then having been being forced to deal with the consequences that he was completely mentally not prepared for. Mm-hmm. Like... Again, I don't know the real life situations. I would not be surprised if I found out that that was the first time that cop had ever seen anyone get shot by a police officer. Yeah. Um, because I've I've dealt with cops, and not all cops are awful people. Uh, I'll I'll give no. that caveat. Police um, officers aren't terrible people. The institution of policing is awful. Yeah. Like, I've dealt with cops, and some of them were nice even when they didn't need to be. Um, and then some of them are just assholes even yeah. when they didn't need to be <laughs> yeah yeah and it's, it's to deal so... with a state trooper they're kind of terrible 
I know. And like, so it's, it's weird to watch movies like Troopers. Yeah. Some, or is it Super Troopers? Yeah, Super Troopers. Because like, yeah, it's kind of a funny movie, but then... Then, like, real life happens, and that, that's a weird time. This is a weird time for that sequel to be coming out. I'm just saying. <laughs> a super weird time for that movie to be coming out. <laughs> like, in the early 2000s, oh, yeah, whatever. It's, it was like the American Pie sicko movie generation kind of thing for comedies, the gross-out comedies, and, and it totally fit. But now it's like, man, you, you want to show a movie about police officers abusing their power in the middle of, like, the fucking biggest state crisis ever? What if, what if Super Troopers 2 is, like, the most woke fucking movie and all the officers are actually, actually end up having to become more responsible because the institutions <laughs> in which they work have gotten so off the fucking rails? <laughs> That's not what that movie's gonna be, but that'd be hilarious. Mm-hmm. You, you are, you are... <laughs> Deeply, deeply overestimating the capacity of the guy who made Beer Fest. I know. I am. I am well aware, Steve. I'm a hope. I'm a hopeless optimist. Um, man. God, I mean, that... his other credits are not only Beer Fest. They are also Dukes of Hazard and Jackass Number Two. So. Okay. To be fair, I actually quite like the Dukes of Hazard movie. That is one Dude. of my favorite car movies. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I Two thousand five one. Yeah. It's got some of the best car action in a film ever. There's like this one, and this has nothing to do with anything, so I'll stop after this. There's this one really cool scene where they are fucking running away from like a million police officers, all the Blues Brothers, and they fucking jump the car on a uh, on a dirt ramp onto a highway, and they get like 20 feet up in the air with the car, and they land, and they shot it all real. And then if you watch the bloopers... There, there's the the reel of them going through like thirty fucking cars to get that shot because every fucking one lands on the highway and falls to pieces like a real car would. They had to like get thirty cars to do it till they got the one car that stayed together long enough to drive off camera. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of my favorite car movies, to be honest. And I and I know the fucking Confederate flag is is stupid as shit. General Lee, the General Lee, not generally the General Lee. It's about the only place I'm comfortable seeing the Confederate flag, and I think it's because I just liked the series first uh, before I understood the, the implications. The, the overt racism. Flag. Yeah, I know, right? Right? It's you got to get in while you're young and, and stupid. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, not that has nothing to do with anything, but it's a nice moment of brevity in this. We do need movie. to take a a break from the tension that is this movie, right? Uh Anyway, I I want a good black car movie. That'd be cool. There's a lot of there's a lot of car culture in in the black community. I'd I'd love a good black car movie. They've done a little bit with the Fast and Furious movies, but you know, just generally. I really there's a really good song about that about how black masculinity is tied to cars, and it's really interesting. Interesting, yeah. I mean, I I think that it would fit. It's it's totally doable. Yeah, and there's a little bit in Fast and Furious, but not as expressly. You know, you got Paul Walker running around and stuff. If you do make that movie, Michael B. Jordan should be in it because he is amazing. Michael B. Jordan should just be in every movie, and he will elevate. Michael B. Jordan, I feel like, of of our generation, he is my favorite actor. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Of he's the a, he's previous good. generation, it would be Michael Fassbender, and of the generation prior to that, it'd be Ian McKellen. But I like of all the actors between the ages of like fifteen to thirty, Michael B. Jordan is my favorite. He's good. Yeah. Uh it's. It's crazy to see what he's been in. Uh, like, you know, I love Chaz- Chadwick Boseman. He's kind of like the Black Panther at this point. Yeah. I, Michael B. Jordan really made me want to see, like, could could Michael B. Jordan have played Black Panther? He could have. I would not have, let, like, I, I would not have um, debated that at all, so. Yeah. What's the, all right, you said that Kugler's worked with Jordan on all of his films, so this, Black Panther, what's the other one? Creed. Creed. Okay, I gotta watch Creed then. Yeah, Creed's amazing. Um, Creed's the best Rocky movie. <laughs> it's 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 not a Rocky movie though. It doesn't have Rocky in the title. <laughs> it's fine. It's a Rocky movie. It's part of the Rocky shared c- cinematic universe. Yeah, the yeah. RCU the Rocky Avengers. <laughs> the RCU. Yeah. <laughs> Who else is in the Rocky Avengers? <laughs> I'm just uh, curious now. Uh, you know, there's a uh, there's Rocky is like the Samuel L. Jackson. Uh, there, uh, Ivan there. Drago's back. Adonis <laughs> Creed is here now with Michael B. Jordan. Yeah. Uh, okay. Anyway, 
what else can we talk about with Fruitvale Station? We need a couple more minutes on this. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to mention is um, the music, because I, I just like talking about scores when it comes to stuff like this, because I think it, it adds a lot of atmosphere, because this is the kind of movie where the score's job is to make sure you don't notice it. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm in a way that it's not with something like Black Panther. And this is the same guy that did Black Panther. Oh, um, interesting. Yeah, this guy's got a lot of musical credits, but, like, he he didn't take off the way he seems to have, with, with, except for when he works with Ryan Coogler. Because he did this, he did Creed, and he did Black Panther, and all three of, of those scores are amazing. Um, but in this, like, it's really kind of haunting. It's really slow. It's, it's intermixed with the scenes really well. Um... There isn't like a particular track that that stands out as much as it's just the way the music kind of just consistently carries through the movie as kind of haunting and looming is really really good. Yeah, I also like the the song choices they they play. Um, mm-hmm. I, I in two thousand eight, I was hanging out with a lot of my friends from high school, and a lot of my friends from high school were black, and so even though I don't listen to rap I, and hip hop and stuff. I recognized a lot of the music they were playing because that was the era of pop rap music that I was listening to uh, because I was always driving somewhere with them. So it's just kind of this weird throwback thing for me. Yeah. Um, I mean, not in an insulting way. This movie does really feel 2009. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it gets it gets the atmosphere and everything, which is crazy because it hasn't changed that much. But there's like, you know, everyone still has the flip phones and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, it's subtle enough. You know, mm-hmm. um, like this is this is prior to gas stations having gas station TV screens and shit. Yeah, so just little things. Yeah, just all the little things really add up to to create that atmosphere because it you know it's just it's I don't see like a modern car at any you know modern new car let me put it that way at any point. Um, so yeah, that that all adds up. I'm see you know obviously. Um, Oscar's driving around in like the uh, the late '90s or, or early 2000s car kind of thing, so just stuff like that. It's mm-hmm. you know nice subtleties of filmmaking. You mentioned something about the um, the guy that did the score, the composer, that I find really interesting because we got Kugler, we got Jordan. Apparently, Kugler's kept with the same composer, and this is a trend that I've started to notice in Hollywood, and I really like it. Wherein we're getting these. It's almost like a, a return to the the um, the troupe of actors back in the day. You know, you'd have like a yeah. a troupe of actors that went town from town to put on the same play or whatever uh, back in like the, the Middle Ages and shit. And it feels like, you know, Nolan did that for a while where like fucking Christian Bale and Michael Caine were in all of his movies. And, and Hans, Hans Zimmerman did, did all the Killian scores. Murphy. Uh, yeah, Killian Murphy too. And Hans Zimmer did the score. Um, obviously if, if I, you go back a little farther, uh, Robert De Niro, De Niro and Scorsese did a lot of things together. It's just interesting that we're getting like this, this kind of, uh, return to form in that way that we're getting all these people like kind of coming back and doing the same, like working together on, on multiple projects and, and, and delivering I think part of consistent what I'm really quality. This is that Hollywood's kind of created this weird division where you get people that are making really small movies that after making a couple of good small ones immediately get snapped up snatched up and have to do really big movies Mm -hmm. and depending on whether or not they're successful and they can keep their composure seems to have a lot to do with keeping the same people around so because because they know they can trust them Mm -hmm. um like i there isn't a lot of consistency between whiplash and la la land which is, I think, partly why I don't like La La Land as much, but, like, the same way with um, Gareth Edwards jumping from um, Godzilla and Rogue One from his, like, his early sci-fi movies. Um, when you're being thrown millions and millions of dollars that you didn't even know what to do with, I think it helps to know a bunch of people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I tend to agree. It's it's interesting to just see that kind of returning um, for that trust thing, and I, I think it's... It's adding something because when you've worked with someone for a while, it creates a, a different chemistry and like you you feel more comfortable suggesting things and stuff like that. And I'm sure there's still onset tension, but I'm sure there's onset you know uh, fraternization, you know familiarity, friendship kind of thing building too, which is nice. Um, I, just, I that stuff comes like, through. 
I, I feel like the the world is not good enough for how pure Ryan Coogler and Michael B. Jordan's friendship is. <laughs> we do not deserve this. We really don't. Steve, you deserve it. I swear you do. I, I swear You're you. just so cute. <laughs> <laughs> Michael B. Jordan on Twitter talking about Goku and Naruto. Like, it's just, it's too pure. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, okay, one thing I, I thought was really interesting is I listened to, um, I think it was Vanity Fair, or not listened, watched a video Vanity Fair did, and they, I didn't realize they were doing this. They, they have a YouTube channel, and they're, like, getting directors to break down just scenes in their movies. Yeah. And so I watched Ryan Coogler break down one of the fight scenes in Black Panther, the the casino one. And I cannot imagine what listening to a commentary with Ryan Coogler would be like because he uses a lot of you knows. And it's it's really interesting because I put him, and this is going to sound like an insult and I don't mean it that way, but I put him in kind of a similar camp just based on that one video and, and you know, thing, like other little snippets of interviews I've seen with him. I put him in a similar camp with Zack Snyder. I'm like, I don't think these dudes know how to express their thoughts any other way but on film. Um, like Zack Snyder, obviously, you can, you can say what you want about him, but he knows how to shoot a scene, if nothing else. Um, and Ryan Coogler, like... Hearing him try to break down how this fight scene worked, uh, it like it didn't really make a lot of sense. But then, like you, until you saw it happening, then you're like, oh, okay. Uh, and so this movie again, I feel like he's got these really interesting, articulate points he wants to make about uh, our culture, our political climate, and all this stuff. But I don't think he, I, I don't think he knows any other way to do it than on film. And so I, I really felt like that stood out here. Um, yeah. So it's just really interesting to see people like, you know, they don't necessarily know how to express it in words, but they know how to tell a story. They know how to show you what they feel or what they think. And I think yeah. that's really cool to see. Um, okay. Uh, is there anything else we want to talk about or do we want to go on to ratings? Uh, I um, think ratings. I, I don't have anything else. I, I was just going to say... This we we're not. I don't think we are overstating this movie. This is a hard thing to watch. So like, if you deal with this kind of reality and you already have some sort of anxiety or depression, try to stay away from this movie. Mm-hmm. Like it's it, it. Don't punish yourself. It, <laughs> if you already know what's happening, you don't necessarily have to relive it in this kind of way. Yeah, this is the movie I want to buy copious copies of on DVD and just throw at people when they yeah. say stupid things. Um, that's what I would like to do. Yeah, like, there, there is a lot of truth and power and tragedy to this, and, like, it would just be mean to say that everyone should watch this movie. Yeah. A certain group of people should watch this movie. Yeah. Yes. Racist old white people should watch this movie. <laughs> Fox News should broadcast this movie 24-7 as opposed to their garbage programming. Um, yes. Honestly. I think that's that's a good way to end. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and do my rating. Uh, I'll give this movie 5 out of 5 um, 24-7 streams of it on Fox News. I'm going to go ahead and give it five out of five dead dogs. Oh, um, I'm going to give it, uh, ooh. uh, I'm going to give it five out of five, uh, uh, birthday cards with white people on it. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot was... how good that scene was. That was really funny. <laughs> Don't give me a white so people card. Funny. She said, don't give me a white people card. Oh, God. I love so much when he's showing it to the, I guess, his uncles. And they're like, oh, come on. And he's like, yeah, yeah, this is for her. I I love that so much. Yeah, that was really funny. Oh, man. Oh, man. That just reminds me of, like, God, black people are hilarious, dude, I swear. Mm -hmm. I remember hanging out with my friend David at his house one time. And, like, the phone started ringing and he's sitting there playing a video game. And and he just starts yelling for his sister. He's like, Misha! Misha! She comes to her dad. She's like, what? Grab the phone for me. And she just got, like, so mad at it. 
<laughs> I just I never would have thought to do shit like that. Anyway, um, all right. Next week is my topic, and normally when we talk about some heavy shit, I'm like, we need a break from the heavy shit. But you know what? Fuck it. We're doing more heavy shit because this has been a topic on mind, and this it, it kind of came up, and we, we danced around the outskirts of it in this, so I wanted to, to just dive into it. Years ago on Geeky Gentlemen, I can say that now because I've been doing this for entirely too long. Years ago on Geeky Gentlemen, we did an episode on comedy. We're gonna do. We're gonna talk about tragedy next time. Yay! Yeah, tragedy and drama. So you know, nice narrow specific field of discussion. Okay. All right, everyone, see you there. It's gonna be heavy. Uh, <laughs> enjoy that. Uh, are we? Are next... we? Are we thinking like tragedy and drama within fiction, or just like tragic? It... No, within fiction. No, no, we're not just going to sit there and talk about nine <laughs> eleven. So here's the time that this innocent puppy was ran over on the streets. <laughs> no, but, no. Which brings us back to Fruitvale Station. Yeah, no, we're going to talk about, about we're going to talk about it in fiction. Um, the the art of tragedy and drama. Um, okay. All right. Okay. No, that, I I couldn't. I'm glad you that. specified and you asked that question because that would have been so dark. <laughs> Let's just everyone tell their saddest story. Yeah. Oh, man, no. <laughs> oh, God. There's going to be a lot of awkward laughs next week. Okay. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, all right, everyone. Thanks very much for watching. Until next time, I'm the Philosopher. I'm the Exile. And I'm the Comic Skid 2099. And we are your geeky gentlemen. And we will be discussing. Depressing.